everybody. So this is me and Derek taking a drive and we're going to do a little Q&A on my best friend having someone in their life with bipolar disorder. So I'm going to ask him some questions and we'll get his answer. And we're doing this because we received such a good response with me doing this with Jason. So now I'm going to do it with my best friend. You ready? Yep. Okay, so question number one. When you found out I had bipolar disorder, did you think less of me? Um, you and I have actually known each other for so long. I don't think I ever didn't know that you had bipolar disorder. Um, I think that I already, I think I knew by the time we really began getting close. And I was, I kept an open, I had an open mind about it. I mean, my original major, a little bit of my background, um, my original major in college was psychology. I actually took abnormal psychology, learned about, learned how to diagnose and all of that stuff um, before you and I ever met, I believe. Um, so I kind of came into it from the get with a pro mental health advocacy and awareness standpoint to begin with. I was never anti any of that and I was brought up to make my decisions on people and judge them by who they are and how they treat me and others as opposed to any illnesses that they may or may not have and that was even before I found out um, that I myself was actually diagnosed with autism at age three but I didn't find out until I was 30 so I don't think that had anything to do with how I was brought up, but I was always taught to judge people for who they are, not for any of their labels. Okay, um, you ready for the next question? Yeah. Okay, what is it like to experience me going through mood swings and or mania? Um... No two times are the same. Um, I mean, we've known each other now, God, almost 20 years. I mean, you, neither you nor I, we just were talking about this the other day. We don't remember when we met. <laughs> um, our joke is after Johnny, before Peanut. So, long time. And... In case you're wondering, Johnny and Peanut are two of my kids. Peanut Sierra... Yeah, and Johnny will be 20 this year, and Sierra will be 16 this year. So that ought to give you an idea of how, how far back she and I go. Um, but I say that it, it was always kind of a case-by-case -case thing, because, you know, sometimes your mood swings are just a mood swing. Um, there have been other times where you've been so far down that, um, full disclosure here, Jen and I actually met through her mother. We were in school together. Um, and her mom and I are also really good friends. But, um, I would say that I've probably seen you at your absolute worst and your absolute best, so... I mean, your mood swings kind of drive me batty at times, but I know I do plenty of crap that drives you batty too, and for better or for worse, we stick with each other. But, you know, there's a difference between a mood swing where you may just be a little cranky versus um, after one of the one of your lower episodes where your mom was a little concerned about you being alone, so... She, I had several days off of work at the time. I don't remember what job I had. Um, so I actually came down and just spent time with you just so that you weren't alone. And I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever knew about that or not. I think I did tell you that afterwards. Yeah, you've told me. 
Um, and then when you're up, when you're up and kind of going into mania, I kind of keep it in the back of my mind. There is like a line. And it's, and it's kind of one of those things where are you just up or are you up to a point where we may need to have a conversation about a literature trip to the hospital? Thankfully, that hasn't happened in several years and I hope that that trend continues. But, I mean, it's a part of the reality. You get something that you know, wh whether it's consciously there or not, it is a, It is sometimes in the back of my mind, and I well, know... Well, furthermore, with that question, going deeper into it, how does it make you feel to watch me go through a manic episode? It's a little heartbreaking at times. Um... It's just when you're going when you're going that when you're going that far into it, it's and knowing what you go through when you come out of it, when you hear about some of the stuff afterwards, it's it's just a little heartbreaking to see it firstly. And Oh, we're being bumped. Yeah, I hit a rough patch of road, sorry. <laughs> and just... There we go again. I have got to find a better road to drive on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there's just the whole... There's just a whole spectrum of feelings that go through, that go through my mind and... Especially when you're going into an episode where you may end up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen you in the hospital for as little as a couple of days. And I was there through the nine-month hospitalization after Sierra was born. Okay, let's clarify that. It was off and on for nine months. Fair. It wasn't an entire solid nine months in the hospital. So, yeah. All right, we're going to move on to the next question. <laughs> Preface this with, sometimes I get upset when you said things to people about my illness. What is it like to have a friendship with someone who can be sensitive about their diagnosis? I think it's gotten easier for me over the years because part of my own pathos is I'm very much an open book and it took a long time for me to realize that not everyone is as open as I am mm -hmm. and the I've accidentally outed you quote unquote more than once and it's never been maliciously yeah and the first time that it happened we were actually with a group of people, some of whom you knew longer than you had known me. And I said something very casually about it, not realizing that I knew something that they didn't. Yeah. And I actually, when you came to me afterwards and you were quite upset about it, and I, A, my first thought was, what's the big deal? It, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And then the second part of it, kind of later, I actually felt bad because I wasn't trying to br I, I wasn't trying to shame you or well if I might add to that just a little bit of backstory about my illness is that early on and during the course of it I used to feel really humiliated about it and I didn't really want anyone to know so I kind of kept it to myself around people but now I'm a little bit more out in the open with it obviously and I think that, that was a little bit hard for Derek to understand with being such an open person that someone would want to keep something like that under wraps and I certainly 
felt a lot of shame and humiliation about it, which is why I didn't want to be completely out with it. Really, just within the last year or two is really when you've begun, begun being more out with it. And even then, it was really, it's actually been several years since you've had a major episode. Yeah, so. it's been about four years now. And I would honestly say that once you made me aware of it and how you felt about it, that I really was much better about... Oh, definitely. You definitely improved on that. Do you have any more to add to that question? Um, I would just say in general with that, if you're someone like me, or if you're in that situation, and now the role is a little bit reversed because I've got some stuff of my own that's kind of resurfacing, and I am much more open. I'm actually, I've actually been quite transparent about my own stuff going on, but I would say don't make an assumption about what may or may not be okay with someone for what to talk about or with whom, especially if it's someone close. And Jen and I are close enough that we were able to have that conversation and be quite candid about it. Um, quite honestly, I requested that we do this video. Um, just because even though Jen and Jason have been together for 13 years now, right? Yes. Okay, yeah, 13 years. And Jen and I, like I said, have known each other almost 20 years there's there's a difference in how we handle things. I knew Jen when she was married to her ex-husband. Um, and that was a few years before Jason came on the scene, obviously. Um, and that's actually part of why I wanted to do this video. And I hope that... My hope in doing this is, A, to get this part of the conversation out as well because I don't think it's something that a lot of people see and I think it's I think it's something that's good to be seen part of maybe it's just because I'm so open in general but I have always been about not keeping things in the dark shining the light on things if you shine light on the monster in the closet you may see that it's a pile of dirty laundry you might have to pull over and park because I'm fighting with this camera. All right, um, there's a supermarket up here. I'll pull over. Okay. We will go ahead and go on to the next question. It can be challenging to be friends with someone with bipolar disorder. How do you cope with my illness? I don't know that I cope with it in any special way. Um... I just think because I, I just it's just we've been friends for so long and like I said I don't think I ever didn't know that you had the that you that you had it so for me it was it's always just been a I guess it's just been a part of the package for better or for worse um, sometimes you've driven me absolutely nuts. I know I drive you nuts. And it's just kind of a give and take. But at the same time, I think you get that in any friendship. It's just that our give and take is a little different. But is it a defining thing? I don't consider it defining when you and I talk. But when I talk about people I when I talk to people I know, it comes up in conversation at times. Not I'm not like saying, oh well, so and so, the lady J has blah blah blah. It's more when I'm talking about it. It's more just um, of speaking of my experiences and my perspective just on things with life and the world in general, like you're not the only person I know with bipolar or other 
health conditions. Um, I worked for several years with physically and mentally indivi- with mentally disabled individuals. I was a caregiver for six years for an ex with some pretty significant physical disabilities whom, in retrospect, I suspect may have also been going into the early stages of dementia. Mm-hmm. Um, I am a natural caregiver. So when I'm talking about things, because even now with my current partner, there was some insecurities when we were first, when we first started dating, being raised about, am I someone who's going to bail when the going gets tough? And <coughs> yeah. that's not me. Mm-hmm. That's never been me. So when I talk about it, I kind of sometimes use some of that is an example of like, yeah, my best friend of 20 years has, well, I have a little pet name for how I describe your condition that I don't know if you're comfortable with me saying on camera, so I won't say it just yet. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I kind of mention it that way because I don't, I think to me, it's just a part of the package. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got bipolar, I'm gay, autistic, with PTSD and ADHD. <laughs> yeah. Okay, moving right along. Uh, number five. When I'm well, my illness is not super noticeable. Is it easier to be around me while I'm well? Um, difficult question. A lot of times, yes, let's be real, it probably is easier to be around you, but I've also been the one that's driven you to the hospital. And the one time I just came over for something, I don't even remember what it was, probably a weekend karaoke at, I think it was at um, the house you lived at two houses ago. Um, Actually, the last physical house. Um, and walked in when you were going into a manic phase, and I think it was Jason, your brother, and I were, like, kind of trying to figure, assess the situation and figure out what to do, Mm -hmm. and believe it or not, that was probably one of the better times for you, because you even acknowledged that day which doesn't always happen with you, that you probably did need to get help. And that actually made me feel a little better about it because, A, it wasn't just me that noticed, and B, I was glad that you were aware of it at that time because that hasn't always been the case. And that, and I think in the end, that actually also ended up being one of the shorter stays. Probably because we caught it very early on, and... It may or may not be fair, and you and I have had this conversation after a hospitalization as well, where you've said you kind of feel like people may be on edge or kind of watching. Mm -hmm. And the honest reality is we probably are. And it's not because we think that you're bad or still sick or that you can't take care of yourself. It's more of we've seen what it does to you from the outside and we also know what it does to us i mean with the after sierra was born um i still remember when there was one point where i think it was right after dave rendered you homeless and you had a really, really bad regression, and at one point they were... Yeah, explain who Dave is, if you're going to talk, if you're going to oh, name names. I'm sorry, I didn't, I don't, I didn't know. Dave is actually her ex-husband. Um, Sierra's father. And, yeah, he did some really, really bad things while she was in the hospital that time, and she technically was homeless, and... It was just a bad situation all around. I really don't want to get into it, but that was one point where nobody was sure what was going to happen long term, and that was kind of a scary thing for all of us, and thank God you came out of that. Um, And you've never been anywhere near that bad since. Again, thank God. 
And I think the fact that you've got a much better support system helps with that. I mean, not that your mom hasn't always been a good support system, but Jason has really stepped up, honestly, more than I expected him to. Um, I'm not dissing Jason at all when I say that, but no offense, you weren't quite what Jason signed up for. <laughs> and I say that with ab and I say that with love. Actually, I was pretty upfront and honest with him about my illness before we got together. Yeah, but it is a little bit different being upfront about it versus seeing a hospitalization happen. True. And again, Matt, and again, Jason has been great to you over the last several years, and Jason's a, Jason's a really an all around Jason's really an all around good guy. Um, whereas your ex, I have friends who are religious fundamentalists who are anti divorce who made an exception in the case of Jen and her ex. We'll just leave it there. Okay, last question. What advice do you have for people who have mental health issues regarding their loved ones? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually answer that from both sides because I have my own mental health issues. Not to, I hate to want to say the severity, um, only because I, I personally haven't been in the hospital, but I've been close. From both sides of it, I would say, and I'll say specifically with you, you've got a good support system and while you may not always agree with some of the rationale behind actions that were taken um do remember that we care about you we want you to be happy we want you to be successful we want you to thrive and I'm kind of asking, let me clarify the question. Okay. I'm asking for you to give your advice to people who have loved ones with a mental illness. Okay. Um, my advice would be, remember, keep in mind that it is an illness. Um, and that a person isn't solely defined by their illness. I mean, some people may be further along in, I don't want to say further along because I don't know, know that I necessarily agree with that. Some people may be better at different places than where they're at in terms of their illnesses or whatever. Um, I'm going to go with my own, I'm going to do a little bit of my own personal disclosure here for a moment. I have autism. I'm very high functioning on the spectrum. I was diagnosed at age three, but I was fully mainstreamed and really never had any special education after age five. And I don't consider my autism to be an illness or an illness or a disability for me, but it is, it is very much a part of who I am. It's kind of, aspects of it are intertwined through my personality, but I also have ADHD, anxiety, and PTSD, completely unrelated to my diagnosis on the spectrum, and those are not things that I consider to be a part of me. Um, they are something that I am struggling with and going through, and I would say the most important thing that you can take out of this from from any aspect of it is be open and honest with your communication. You do what you can to understand what's going on with their illness and the state of the illness and how they feel about it. I think that was probably my biggest mistake with you early on because I am such an open book where, mm -hmm. like, talking about the stuff that I've got going on right now, even though I nearly did check into a hospital a week ago, it doesn't bother me to talk about that. Whereas you have a completely different, or had a completely different feeling about that. And that isn't something, and that was something that I failed to take into consideration that 
for something that for me is a non-issue may be a huge issue for someone else. And I don't want to give blanket advice for, oh, yes, you need to treat all bipolar people this way. Or you need to treat all people on the autism spectrum this way. You need to treat all people with anxiety, depression, ADHD, mobility issues, whatever. We're all people. All of us. We all have our unique quirks and things that we like about ourselves, things that we wish to change and improve about ourselves, our own idiosyncrasies, our own values, our own mores. The mental illness aspect of it doesn't change that. We are all still individual people. Jen is not her illness. The illness realistically is a part of who you are because there isn't a cure for it. And even if there was a cure for it, I can't speak for you. Some people may not want to take a cure for it. Like, if someone were to walk up to me tomorrow and say, we can cure autism, I wouldn't take the cure. I'm okay with that. But I can't say that someone... I can't say that my answer wouldn't be different if I were even lower functioning on the spectrum. I mean, like, if I were a nonverbal individual who was compliant and potentially institutionalized, I might have a different answer to that. Or if my own issues did result in me being periodically hospitalized for anywhere from several days up to several months, I don't know how that would affect my answer. And even with some of the stuff that I've got going on now, I'm dealing with some things that really, for me, myself, go back 30 years. And even dealing with some of that now, there is even a sense of loss for the time that was, for the time that was lost in that with my own stuff. And I can only imagine that that would be the same with someone else with illness of any kind. So don't make assumptions for someone else. Be open, be honest, be communicative. Listen to what they have to say. We are our own best advocates. If you are, if you have a friend or a loved one who is suffering from a mental illness or any type of physical illness even, if they're not able to be their own advocate, don't be afraid to be an advocate for them. Um, that's something that I've dedicated a large portion of my life to. Um, not so much with you, ironically. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I have offered, but I don't think you've necessarily... You've had a good support system in your mom and in Jason, but... I guess it's just my best advice is don't take everything as a all-blanket situation. Take it on a case-by-case -case basis, even with the individual. Not even with Jen with, over the 20 ish years we've known each other. No two instances where your illness has manifested itself have been the same. Mm -hmm. And the way that I've handled it has varied depending on what's going on. And I, I guess that's really at the end of the day my best advice is take the time to know the person that you're in your life who has that you and keep in mind that even if they can't speak for themselves don't be afraid to, don't be afraid to be an advocate when there may not be someone else to advocate for them because a lot of people end up in the system with nobody and it may not necessarily be because there's someone who doesn't care it may even be that there's no one there who knows what to do Thank you, Derek. Very true. Um, I wanted to make a point before we close off this video that this video is being done in collaboration between the two of our channels and we are going to do a video that's a little bit more lighthearted and fun and put it on his channel. So if you please could check out his channel. It's called a Sly Fox's Den. Is that what it is? 
I think I named it a Sly Fox Den. A Sly Fox Den, and I will link it down in the description so you will have no trouble finding it. All right, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like the channel, please consider subscribing and giving me a big thumbs up, and I'll see you in the next one.